First song will be number 469. 469. Here we are, but straying pilgrims, where our path is often dim, but to cheer us on our journeys to sing this place I hear. have our first prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this beautiful day that you've given us. Father, may we use it to the best of our abilities to worship you and to praise you and give you all the glory and, and things of, of this earth. Father, we pray you and we love you, and we're glad that we're here tonight to sing songs of praise to you, to study your word, and to enlighten our lives. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with those that are sick or unable to hear. Bless them, Father, take care of them, and bring them back to our fold again. Heavenly Father, we pray for the churches of our Christ, and, and everywhere pray that the Lord, to the Lord, that the Message will be spread out throughout the land, Father, that we could be enlightened by, by your word and we could all come together. Unite us, Father, in, in your love. Be with us tonight, Father, as we sing songs of praise and bless those that are participating. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our song following our devotion, number 745, 745, verses 1, 3, and 5. Song before our lesson, 795. And if it's convenient, please stand. This world is not my home, I am just passing through. My friends are in love, so many of the world. The angels beckon me from the heavens open floor. And I can't, but I don't in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, I do love, I have no friend like you. If heaven is not my home,
you have a bucket list? If you do, what's in your bucket list? You know, I've never thought much about having a bucket list, but not even sure I know what a bucket list is. So what is a bucket list? This term was popularized back in a movie in uh, 2007. Uh, the name of that was The Bucket List, and it starred actors Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. And the phrase bucket list comes from the phrase to kick the bucket. But what's a bucket? The original term was probably buck-er, B-U-C-K-E-R, rather than B-U-C-K-E-T. Uh, back in the 1700s over in England, when pigs were to be killed, when pigs were to be killed, they were hung by their hind legs with a rope. The rope was tied to the uh, uh, to a couple of oxen, and then they were pulled across. The, the rope was thrown over a crossbar, a bar, a transverse crossbar, and this crossbar was known as a bucker, B-U-C-K-E-R or it uh, later became known as a bucket. So the oxen would walk a few yards, they would pull the rope, and up would go the, uh, the pig. So the pig would begin squealing, and he would begin kicking fiercely, and as it reached the crossbar, or the bucker, or the bucket, then it would kick the bucket. So to kick the bucket was to be hung from the bucket by the heels until dead, back in the days of, of uh, early England. So in modern day usage, uh, of course, we know to kick the bucket means to die. Now we can define the, the phrase bucket list using the current concept of a bucket, which has a pail, it's a pail with a handle on it. Uh, it can contain anything. And so the phrase, the bucket list is used to describe just about anything that anybody hopes to accomplish before they die. So people often create a bucket, bucket list as they near retirement and they strive to uh, make time to do those things that are on their bucket list. And it can be anything uh, just very simple all the way up to, um, you know, climbing a mountain, uh, going skydiving, uh, traveling to each of the 50 states or the seven continents of the, of the world. So it can be just about anything. Now, as a Christian, what's on my bucket list? What can we glean from the scriptures that will help us to form our Christian bucket list? So this, uh, this evening, I just want to take a few minutes. Let's let the Apostle Paul make some suggestions for our bucket list. And we'll talk about just a few of these. There's many, many uh, of these things that we can pull from the scriptures. But first of all, we can... Uh, Add to our bucket list to become a joyful person. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, Rejoice. Now, we know that this was uh, written from prison. The book of Philippians was written while Paul was in prison in Rome. And uh, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul detailed the many things, the many hardships that he endured during his life. Among those things were, uh, of the Jews, five times he received 40 stripes, save one stripe, he wrote. Thrice he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Thrice he suffered, suffered shipwreck. And a night and a day he spent in the deep. So he had many, many hardships. But yet, from prison, he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he wrote, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at your last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, whatever state I am, to be content. So Paul was a very joyful person in spite of the very uh, things that he had to endure uh, in his ministry for Christ. Our second item we can add to our bucket list is we can improve our prayer life. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul wrote, Be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be, named, be made known to God. And then he added, if we do this, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So we can improve our prayer life. I know I certainly can do that. In 1 Thessalonians, he wrote in chapter 5, Again, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So let's improve our prayer lives. Thirdly, we can certainly improve our thoughts. He wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. And then he said, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the result, he says, the God of peace will be with you. So we can improve our thoughts by thinking on these things that he's enumerated in, in Philippians chapter 4. Next, we can add to our bucket list to seek spiritual things. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul wrote, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, and not on things on the earth. Our Lord himself wrote uh, or said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, where neither no moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For well, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's set our minds on spiritual things, things that are above, rather than things here on this earth. Number five, we can press toward the goal of heaven. Recall Saul's prior life as a persecutor of the church. Uh, he even gave approval to the putting uh, to death of Christians. But he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to things which are ahead, I press toward the mark, towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So even though he persecuted the, the church, he was one of the, the heavier persecutors of the church. In spite of that, he put those things behind him and he pressed toward the mark of the goal for the prize of heaven. Number six. We can study the Bible more. We know in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we're told to study or be diligent, the New King James Version says, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, many people have as a goal, as a, as a bucket list, to uh, read the entire Bible in one year. And while that's commendable, do you really study that, those scriptures? Here the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to study, to show yourself approved unto God. That involves getting down and really digging into the meaning of what the scriptures are. So don't just read, but study the Bible. And then the last one I'll mention, and there's many, many more we could add to this list. We can come to worship service to give rather than to receive. There's many people, I think, that uh, think they can't get anything out of, our, out of worship services. But the fact is, we can only get out of the services what we put into the, to the services. If I come to, to, to worship with an empty bucket and put nothing into it, if I have no interest in what is being said, if I don't listen and, and hear what's being said, then I will leave with an empty bucket. And if we keep that up, uh, the bottom of our buckets will rust. 
But every song that we sing can remind us of biblical truths and praise to God. Every thought that's expressed in prayer should remind us of our own blessings and of our own praying and how I can improve it. Every point that's made in remarks at the Lord's table should cause us to be more thankful for the sacrifice of Christ and make us more appreciative of Him and His blood that He shed in our place. Participating in giving to the Lord's cause will give us a greater appreciation for, the, for a love of the kingdom and its work and for being and having a part in it. And even in the announcements that are being made, we can see opportunities presented in those announcements for opportunities for service to uh, visit the sick and the shut-ins, the bereaved, opportunities to greet and to welcome others that come into our, to our midst. So these are just a few of the things that I have identified that a Christian can add to their bucket list. Again, there's many, many more that we could add. At this time, if there's anyone that has a need to respond to the invitation, we would invite you to come forward. Very good to see everybody that's here this evening. Uh, we have some visitors and we appreciate y'all coming our way and hopefully you'll be uh, benefited through our studies from God's word. Um, just this one quick announcement before we have our dismissal prayer and go to our class. Um, we've had a slight change in our formatting for our summer series that which begins next Wednesday evening. Um, the, uh, we, we will have a regular devotional just like we had tonight. We'll have the songs, the devotional prayer and dismissal prayer. And uh, the children ages, uh, let me get this right, uh, sixth grade through adult will stay here in the auditorium and the younger kids will go uh, to uh, a class that's organized by Chase Gardner. And uh, also Denise will have a class, they'll split the class sometimes uh, boys versus girls, and so Denise will help out with that. So they'll have lessons and service projects and that, among other things that they'll be talking about. So this will occur next Wednesday, and so all of the men that are on the schedule for the summer series presentations, we also need for y'all to help prepare for some devotionals during that same period of time, and I'll be visiting with y'all about that very soon. Any other announcements? All right, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for this opportunity that we can come together uh, as your uh, people, as your congregation, Father, to uh, pause during our busy weeks and to open up your word, to study from your word, to offer up these songs of praises to thee, and to uh, worship thee. Father, at this time, we're mindful of those of our number that need our prayers. We're mindful of our sister, Vicki. We're mindful of Rita and others that are on our prayer list. And we pray, Father, that uh, if it be your will, that uh, the things that are being done to, to uh, 
Treat them will be beneficial to their health. This time, Father, we pray for this congregation. We pray for each and every one of us. Uh, we would pray that we'll always be willing to open up your word, to study from your word, to learn what your will for us would be. And we pray we'll apply those to our lives, Father. This time we would ask you, to, you would be with us as we continue to our classes and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's good to see each and every one of you here this evening. And uh, as Ron was saying at the end of the devotional period, or before the closing prayer, um, tonight is, or next week starts the summer quarter. And so, so this is our last class. Um, and you notice uh, you, we've got a two-sided handout, so... Uh, probably not going to get through all this material, but at least you'll have some references there um, and uh, to uh, to take home with you and, and to look up as well. Um, there are a couple of uh, extra biblical references, so I will try to, hopefully we'll get to those and I can read those, uh, but they are in public domain, so you can as I mentioned, Tobit, the book of Tobit is uh, part of the Apocrypha. So um, in your Bible software, usually you will find a Catholic edition of, of the scriptures that will have the Apocrypha. I use, I still use eSword on my laptop. And so you can download the, the King James uh, Bible with the Apocrypha uh, on that, through that software. And uh, I didn't look on... Um, uh, the U -ver I have U version app on my on my phone, but uh, those types of things. Um, but then, as far as the Testament of Jacob, I looked that up online. When it, whenever you want to search for that, just like search Testament of Jacob PDF, and if there is a free version available, uh, it'll usually you'll be able to pull it up. Um, and actually, on that one. That was from, uh, I got that off of the JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R, the, I forget what all that stands for exactly, but that, that's an acronym, but um, uh, off of their website, and they will allow you to create a free account, and you can look up uh, in their library, you can look, you can uh, read up to 100 free articles a month just by creating a free account on their website uh, and a lot of those are uh, journals journal articles and and uh, but they have some some older manuscripts like this these extra biblical texts the uh, the testament of Jacob was dated 
Uh, it's an early Christian writing. It's dated somewhere in the 2nd to 3rd century uh, A.D. But anyway, uh, we'll get to that stuff. So, we uh, in this study, um, of course our study has been a little broader than just angels per se. And so we have looked at uh, spiritual beings in the Old Testament and some of the extra-biblical literature, uh, intertestamental writings, or I have used the phrase Second Temple literature, Jewish literature. And, uh, and then we've, the last couple of weeks we've been looking at the term in the New Testament. And that's what we're going to wrap up on tonight. Uh, And we talked about how the word angel in our New Testament, the Greek word angel, is kind of a lot of those, a lot of the terminology from the Old Testament in reference to spiritual beings, divine beings, the hosts of heaven, uh, the heavenly ones, the holy ones, all of those terms that we see in the Old Testament kind of get lumped into, and even the term Elohim in the Old Testament Uh, which refers to spiritual beings. Uh, A lot of times we see the heavenly host as as, uh, we read several passages that represent God, the most high God, uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, among his heavenly hosts in in some sort of, uh, you know, some have described it as kind of a council meeting or or some would describe it as kind of God's... uh, you know, God's war room or God's planning, uh, you know, board meeting, how it, whatever metaphor you want to, analogy you want to think of in, in those terms. But even the term Elohim in the, in the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is translated as angelos or angel. And so in the New Testament, this, this term angel uh, kind of lumps in a lot of the terminology from the Old Testament uh, and the the Second Temple literature. Um, But mainly it refers to spiritual beings uh, that are faithful to God, to the Most High God. And uh, and so different terminology is is used in the New Testament times. It's where the word, our, our English word demon comes in, the Greek word daimonion, um, which, uh, which was not always an evil entity, but uh, the, the English word demon has come to mean that. Uh, but I mentioned from the very beginning, we weren't focusing on the, on the dark side this time. We were focusing on spiritual beings, divine beings who are faithful in their service to uh, the God of heaven. And so um, let's jump back into what angels do in the new testament or what how we see them described in the new testament they minister on the behalf of believers remember our passage we referenced last week from hebrews 1 14 they are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation who is to inherit salvation we are humans humans who have put their trust in god and who are part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Some ways in the New Testament that we see these uh, angels ministering on behalf of believers. They they delivered apostles from prison. One comforted Paul when his life was threatened. Uh, They brought messages to people in dreams. Uh, Joseph, Mary in visions, Zechariah, Cornelius, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary at the empty tomb. And uh, we, we mentioned those uh, hurriedly at the end of last week. But also, this is kind of getting into the new stuff. Um, number three there under, under the first main point. Uh, angels could encounter humans. So there, there are some, some uh, times where like the Joseph's dream or Mary's vision and these sorts of things. But angels also could encounter humans physically. An angel struck Peter on his side to awaken him in prison and then supernaturally freed him from his shackles and from the prison itself uh, by an earthquake. 
and uh, but physically struck him. And so the, the angel was not just a dream, you know. And Peter had the, you know, I, I imagine Peter had the, the sore ribs to, uh, to prove that that was uh, more than just a dream or a vision. There was, there was someone physically there. This angel was physically there. Uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Philip. Uh, now the terminology there appeared to Philip, but um, it's not specifically called a vision. And so a physical appearance is a possible and a very probable interpretation of, uh, of a uh, of a, an individual uh, appearing to Philip and, of course, instructing him to go meet uh, meet the Ethiopian. Uh, angels ministered to Jesus after his testing in the wilderness. We see this in Matthew 4:11, uh, the parallel passage in Mark 1 and verse 13. And an angel rolled back the stone covering the tomb of Jesus, a very physical action. Uh, and then sat upon it when uh, when others came to visit the tomb. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> some other things that angels do in the New Testament, they interpret visions or divine decrees. Now this is drawing from Old Testament apocalyptic literature, in, uh, such as the book of Daniel. Uh, in the second half of the book of Daniel, when Daniel is is given these visions and these dreams, uh, and some of which are are, are very uh, terrifying and, and upsetting to Daniel. You know, he mentions how he was lying on his bed, and and after seeing some of these visions, he basically says they they made me sick. I, you know, I physically made him sick. Uh, what he what he witnessed or what he saw in these visions. And a lot of the things in these visions, there will be a man there, and he has to go ask the man, uh, you know, who, who is an angel, uh, he has to go ask the man, what do these things mean? And then the angel will interpret uh, what these visions are represent to Daniel. Uh, Zechariah has some of these. Zechariah has uh, uh, parts of Zechariah are, are these this style of apocalyptic literature and in these visions that are that are given to Zechariah there are angels who will uh, interpret some of these things as well but we see this uh, in the apocalyptic writings of the book of Revelation it has angels regularly interpret the visions seen by John um, let's Let's look up some of these since we're in the same book. We can kind of flip pretty quickly and just reference how, uh, you know, John doesn't always understand what he is seeing either. And uh, it, at the very beginning of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. Uh, so uh, this is how God makes these visions known to John, sending an angel to him. In chapter 4, verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And so here's this individual, this, this divine being, this spiritual being, this angel who is going to, uh, to reveal and to explain what John is about to see. Uh, over in chapter 10, verses 7 through 8, or 7 through 10. But that in the days of the trumpet, call to be sounded by the seventh angel the mystery of god will be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophets then the voice that i had heard from heaven spoke to me again saying go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land and so i went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll and he said to me take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter 
but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from his hand, from the hand of the angel, and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. So again, this explanation by these angels or this voice from heaven in regards to what is going on, what John is is witnessing. Uh, in 17, chapter 17, verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. So showing, the idea of showing this is not just, hey, look at this, but also the idea of, of explanation and understanding as well. Uh, verse 17 of that same chapter. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out this purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Again, explaining what's going on here in the vision that he is receiving. Chapters 21, verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, uh, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride and the wife of <clears throat> the Lamb. And then uh, verse 10 as well. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. From God. And so uh, here the angel is describing what's going on and then also takes him in the spirit to witness, uh, to witness what is going on. And then finally chapter 22 verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 6, again, just these references to the actions of the angels to help explain to John what he is witnessing. Uh, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what, what must soon take place. And then verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. And of course, the angel refuses to accept his worship. Angels are also described in an advocacy role. And so, uh, you know, someone who is an advocate for another is, uh, is someone who is there uh, in sort of a guardianship role, and so this is this uh, these passages are where the uh, the idea or the concept of quote unquote guardian angels come from. Uh, the first one in uh, Matthew chapter 18. This is probably the most familiar passage uh, in regards to this this topic, uh, but we do we see what Jesus says. Uh, Matthew 18 and verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones for I, cause the children were trying to come and you know, the crowd was like keeping them back, you know, like don't bother Jesus. And he says, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. And so, uh, so this idea of the, their angels, the angels of these little ones, uh, stand in the presence of God, you know, see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And so the idea of standing before uh, or representing one in, in, uh, to another, this, this uh, role as an advocate or guardianship uh, is where this comes from. This idea was also prevalent in uh, Jewish writings. And so from the Testament of Jacob, uh, it's a, it is a rather lengthy reading, but uh, I looked it up and was just perusing through it online, and I thought uh, I'd never even heard of it before. But uh, they said it's probably written in the uh, late uh, second century, which is the late 100s uh, to into the 200, early 200s A.D. 
And so we're, we're within 150 years or so, uh, 150 to 200 years of the beginning of the church. And, um, and I just, I think you'll find it interesting, some of the thoughts of these early, early Christian writers. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and I'm reading from the, the Testament of Jacob, from, from chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 11. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, we begin with the help of God Most High and through His mediation to write the life story of our father, the patriarch Jacob, son of the patriarch Isaac, on the 28th day of the month of Misri. May the blessing of His prayer guard us and protect us from the temptations of the obstinate enemy. Amen, amen, amen. He said, Come. Listen, my beloved ones and my brethren who love the Lord to what has been received. This is Jacob speaking. Now when the time of our father Jacob, father of fathers, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, approached and drew near for him to steal away from his body, this faithful one was advanced in years and distinction. And so the Lord sent to him Michael, the chief of the angels, who said to him, O Israel, my beloved, of noble lineage, write down your spoken legacy and your instruction for your household and give them a covenant. Also concern yourself with the proper ordering of your household, for the time has drawn near for you to go to your fathers to rejoice with them forever. So when our father Jacob, the faithful one, heard this from the angel, he answered and said, as was his custom every day to speak in this manner with the angels, let the will of the Lord be done. And God pronounced a blessing upon our father Jacob. Jacob had a secluded place which he would enter to offer his prayers before the Lord in the night and in the day. The angels would visit him and guard him and strengthen him in all things. God blessed him and multiplied his people in the land of Egypt at the time when he went down to the land of Egypt to meet his son Joseph. His eyes had become dull from weeping, but when he went down to Egypt, he saw clearly when he beheld his son. So Jacob, Israel, bowed with his face to the ground, then fell upon the neck of his son Joseph and kissed him while weeping and saying, I can die now, O my son, because I have seen your face once more in my lifetime, O my beloved son. Chapter 2 begins this way. Joseph continued to rule over all Egypt, while Jacob stayed in the land of Goshen for 17 years and became very old. So when his lifespan was completed, he continually kept all the commandments and feared the Lord. His eyes grew dim and his <coughs> in his lifetime was so nearly finished that he could not see a single person because of his long life and senility. Then he lifted his eyes toward the light of Isaac, but he was afraid and became disturbed. So the angel said to him, Do not fear, O Jacob, I am the angel who has been walking with you and guarding you from your infancy. I announced that you would... Uh, that you would receive the blessing of your father and of Rebekah, your mother. I am the one who is with you, O Israel, in all your acts and in everything which you have witnessed. I saved you from Laban when he was endangering you and pursuing you. And at that time, I gave you all his possessions and blessed you, your wives, your children, and your flocks. I am the one who saved you from the hand of Esau. I am the one who accompanied you to the land of Egypt, O Israel, and a very great people was given to you. So I uh, thought that was interesting. It, it, I mean, it very distinctly uh, just, just uh, tells the story as Jacob, uh, at one time, you know, Michael himself was sent uh, to Jacob to give him some information, but then this other angel was was there that says that I was guarding you, I was protecting you from, even from your infancy. And, and so this angel was watching over him. And so that's where, you know, another idea where this idea and this concept of, of guardian angels uh, go, go way back uh, in the early church. 
<coughs> but also coming out of some of those Jewish writings as well. And then we referenced uh, the book of Tobit a couple of weeks ago uh, in the Apocrypha. And in Tobit chapter 5, uh, Tobit is, has, is sending his son Tobias on this journey. Uh, and Tobias finds a man who will, who, will, who will go on this journey with him uh, to watch over him. And that ends up being the angel Raphael. Uh, we mentioned that before. But, but reading from Tobit chapter 5, verses 17 through 22. Uh, but Anna, his mother, this was Tobit's wife. Uh, but Anna, his mother, wept and said to Tobit, Why hast thou sent away our son? This is from the King James Bible Apocrypha. Is he not the staff of our hand in going in and out before us? Be not greedy to add money to money, but let it be as refuse in respect of our child. For that which the Lord hath given us to live with doth suffice us. Then said Tobit to her, Take no care, my sister, he shall return in safety, and thine eyes shall see him, for the good angel will keep him company, and his journey shall be prosperous, and he shall return safe. And then she made an end of weeping. So there's a couple of uh, extra biblical idea, uh, sources there, references to, uh, to angels ministering and uh, in an adv advocacy or, or overseeing type role. But uh, in Acts chapter 12, this <clears throat> Acts chapter 12 could have some kind of angelic oversight or protection in view. If you remember in Acts chapter 12, that when Peter was imprisoned, <coughs> and of course when Peter was released from prison by the angel, then uh, Peter, once he, once he is outside the prison and and he kind of comes to his senses and realizes, oh, that wasn't a dream. An angel really let me out, and I'm, I'm really out. And so he goes to <clears throat> the home of Mary, who was the mother of John Mark. And Luke tells us that, that many disciples had gathered at her house, and they were praying. We presume that they were praying for Peter. Remember, because James, the apostle James, had been beheaded by Herod, and, and so Herod had got another apostle and was going was gonna to put Peter to death as well. And so Peter goes to the house and he's knocking on the outer gate. And this servant girl, Rhoda, hears his knocking. And as she comes, she recognizes the voice of Peter. But she gets so excited, she doesn't open the door. She runs back inside. And she's telling everyone, Peter's here, Peter's here. You remember their response? They didn't believe her. And they just said, oh, it, it's his angel. That's what the people inside the house were saying. And, uh, and so we talked about this in our study of Acts. And how, how do we understand that? Uh, and w was this part of the Jewish thought that, that everybody, you know, that you had an angel, kind of an angel advocate or this, this angel, uh, you know, watching over you? Uh, or did they believe that Peter... Maybe Peter was put to death earlier than expected, or or he went ahead and was, they went ahead and put him to death, and so this was, was kind of his spirit, you know, that had shown up. So uh, I kind of take it as that they, well, I don't really, I don't really know how to take it. I can just uh, just look at the options, and and uh, y'all may have an opinion on that or not. Uh, but it could be read as if. This is this was his angel, uh, and maybe coming to announce some news about Peter or whatever. But of course, it ended up being Peter himself. Uh, but that was their thought. That was their first thought when she's like, "Peter is at the gate," and they're like, "No, he's in prison. And it couldn't be Peter." So it you know it's his angel. Um, but anyway, uh, but that that could be read in in that way. Also, what angels, we see actions of angels in the New Testament um, as jud um, performing judgment of unbelievers. Both the Old and New Testament describe God as having angel armies to punish the wicked. Uh, almost all of these references are portrayals of, 
are they are eschatological that's a big fancy term referring to a time of judgment by god or quote end times and so uh there's one exception in the new testament where uh an angel is is sent in judgment of herod in acts chapter 12 that's after the peter incident at the end of that chapter uh when he goes up to tyre and sidon and he's got a grievance against the people there he's upset with them and uh, so so they have this big uh, uh he goes before the people and and they're you know shouting uh the 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 voice of a god and not of a man and he accepts their this praise uh, in his arrogance and we're we're told luke says that that an angel was sent and and struck him and that he he died soon after that so that was the an angel carrying out god's judgment against herod uh, in that sense and that was an immediate that was an immediate judgment that took place but all the other references uh, are referring to the day of the lord or the second coming uh, the end times some examples of those in uh, matthew chapter 13 Jesus tells the parable of the weeds among the wheat, and uh, he follows that by explaining the parable in verses 36 through 43. And in that passage, um, in that passage, he talks about how at the end of time, uh, just as uh, the harvest is the close of the age, this is verse 40, or no, verse 39, the harvest is the close of the age and the reapers are angels. And just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. So we see uh, judge, you know, angels being uh, used to deliver judgment. Uh, in that same chapter, the parable of the net. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is like some versions say the drag net, and it's drug along through the water, and it catches all kinds of fish, and and of course those fish have to be sorted out, and uh, and so so it is at um, there it says uh, so it will be at the close of the age, verse forty nine. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. Um, angels will be present at the second coming. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-8. Paul is, is writing to the Thessalonians, <coughs> especially in reference to the persecution that they're undergoing. And Paul is basically saying, you know, don't, uh, don't worry about those who are persecuting because, because God... Uh, you know, God is going to judge them when when the Lord returns with His angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and who have, have not obeyed uh, the gospel. Angels, <clears throat> angels also function in the role of destroyers in John's apocalyptic visions, salting the earth and the wicked with plagues, war, famine, disease, and cosmic upheaval. Uh, and we don't have time to look at all those references in Revelation, but you can do that. Uh, during these times of judgment, angels also warn the inhabitants of earth and encourage the righteous to endure. That's Revelation 14, 6 through 10. And uh, these legions of angels uh, could be called into action by Jesus or God. Matthew 26 is, is uh, the quote from Jesus when... Uh, when his apostle, he, they come to arrest him, and you remember Peter's ready to fight. He draws a sword, and Jesus says, no, put away your sword. Don't you know that I could call down legions of angels, you know, right now, if, if I wanted to? That's paraphrasing, of course. Um, but angels were at the beck and call of God the Father and of Jesus uh, and then the, re the reverse situation is also uh, referenced in the New Testament, the gathering of the elect as described 
<coughs> in Mark 13, 27. And the parallel passage there is, is Matthew 24, 31. Angels are more generally described as just accompanying the Lord, uh, accompanying the Lord at His return, at His second coming. That's Matthew 16, 27, those, and those references there as well. And then I'm, no, I'm speeding through. But they, they also are described in the New Testament as rendering service in heaven. We see them praising God in Revelation 5, 11, and 12. Also, Revelation 7, 11. They join in with that throng, the, the myriads, the thousands of thousands, the, all those angelic beings uh, that join in uh, with the human element, the, the elders and the, the, uh, the spirits of the saints, um, you know, these, these, uh, these dead Christians, these faithful, the faithful dead Christians are seen worshiping, bowing down to the throne, to God's throne in heaven. And then in chapter 5 and chapter 7, then the thousands and thousands, the hosts of heaven are seen joining in to that praise and that worship of God. Uh, they are also part of the heavenly council or the divine entourage as far as, um, as far as witnessing judgment. And you can read about, you can read that in Revelation 3, 5, and then 12, 8, and 9, when the Lord talks about how, uh, how those who are not faithful to him or, or you know, don't confess him, then, then he will deny them before the Holy One and or before God the Father and before his holy angels. So the angels are witness to these, to these decrees and these pronouncements of judgment. Uh, but then also the, talking about the service in heaven, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 is a wonderful passage there, and I'll let you, you can read that on your own, but believers ultimately will be welcomed into that assembly. And that's what Hebrews chapter 2 is talking about, how the Lord, see, he had to become, God had to become human. And you want, if you've ever asked, you know, we sing the song, why did my Savior come to earth? Why, why did God have to become human? Because God can't die. And so God had to become human so that he could die, so that he could take our place, so that he could be our sacrifice. And, but because of that, and because of that relationship, God becoming man, and now God can relate to us personally through Jesus and also through what Jesus has done and through his perfecting by suffering. It talks about there in Hebrews chapter 2 that now he, he welcomes us as his brothers and sisters into the assembly, into the congregation into the kingdom of God. And uh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing that will be ultimately. All right. Appreciate your attention. And, uh, uh, and as I tried to fly through all of that information, and uh, uh, I hope that you enjoyed the study. I hope that it was beneficial for you. And, you know, maybe somewhere down the road we'll, we'll have opportunity to maybe because uh, I know some people have expressed, you know, talking about the spiritual realm and, and these be spiritual beings, you know, what about the bad ones? What about the evil ones? And so, you know, maybe, maybe in the future we can, we can do some sort of study uh, on, you know, on demons and, and on that topic as well. But, uh, all right, let's have a word of prayer as we dismiss. <coughs> Father, again, we are so thankful for this time that's been set aside to come together, to encourage one another, to uh, sing to you and to sing to one another, to look to your word as our guide. Father, we are thankful for your word. We are also thankful for your word that became flesh. We're thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you'll uh, be with us as we depart and go to our separate places and that you will bless us and keep us in your care. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.